All right, good morning. It's Scott from RedmondPhysicsTutoring.com, and uh, it's time for this week's office hour. It's November 1st, 2016. I'm looking at my watch, even though I'm looking at the date. Anyway, it does have the date on it. Um, so I'm doing office hours. The idea is that I'll be here and definitely online until 1030, and I can stay till 11 if there are lots of questions. Until now, I haven't had any takers, but I'm going to keep testing it out this semester uh, be just to see if I can help more people. And when I don't have anybody on right now, and I'll, I'll again wait for at least another half hour until 1030 to see if somebody does come on. But when there isn't anybody here, I'm just going to go ahead and solve a practice problem that I have from a test in NYB, which was electricity and magnetism here in the Quebec CEGEP system. So for me to do that right now, since I'm just doing the recording, I don't need to do a screen share at the moment. This is what the appear.in site looks like. I need to still spiff it up a wee bit with my logo. But anyway, you can come here by going to appear.in slash Redmond Physics Tutoring. Or if you go to redmondphysicstutoring.com, there's a big button there to give you access to the site. And also another button to take you to the YouTube channel where you can see recordings like this one. And yep recording. So let's take a look at the problem. So this was a fairly tricky problem. I don't have the data right now to show me how my students did on this problem. But it is something that we didn't really look at in class very much. And the reason I say that, and I'm going to bring out ink to go here to make sure that's thin. Yep, that looks good. Wipe that. The reason I say that is because this part in blue is a typical circuit. We have the EMF, we have a capacitor, and we have a resistor, so it's a typical RC circuit. What this problem does is it adds a switch and it adds another resistor. And then we're given some information about the parallel plate capacitor C. We're given the area as 0.5 meters squared separated by a distance of 10 to the negative 8 meters. Wow, that's what, 10 nanometers. And is initially uncharged at t equals zero second, and then we have a, b, c, d, and e here. So at t equals 0 0.5 seconds, we have to find the current through this 800 ohm resistor. At the same time, we have to find the power output of the battery. I'm calling this the battery. Then at the same time, how much energy is stored on the capacitor? And so we're looking at energy, which means that the units are going to be in joules. Whoops, that's not what I wanted there. And then at the same time, what is the rate of energy storage? And so a rate of something is basically divided per, by the second. So we would have joules per second. That's my cursive J. That's <laughs> printed J. And one joule per second is equal to one watt for part D. And then part E. Then we take this switch and we close it. And we have to briefly explain how the answer to part A would change with that switch closed. All right, so let's start off with part A. We'll take a look at this. So we have to find the current through the 800 ohm resistor. One of the neat things about this, with the switch open, that means the current through this branch, and I'm just going to call this I2, because I know in a second I'm going to be having I through something else. This current has to be zero, because there's an open switch. There can't be any current through that and that same current going through this 550 ohm resistor would also be zero because there's no current in that part of the branch. So really all we have then is current going through this part of the branch. So I'm just going to draw it like this. We'd have current going through that part of the branch or that loop, I guess. Um, I guess I would start it through the EMF, 25 volts through the capacitor through the resistor. So this is basically, it's just that simple RC circuit where we just have one EMF, one capacitor, one resistor. And since we're looking for the current, then we're looking for the current. Actually, what is it? Oops, don't want thick. What I want is black there. So the current at some point in time is equal to the initial current, which uh, we get. And there are different ways of looking at this. So I'll call it I naught. 
and the reason I'm pausing here is just because I know that in the solution that I wrote it out a little bit differently, um, then we have e to the negative t over tau, where the tau is the time constant, and that's equal to rc. When you have multiple resistors and capacitors, one of the questions that comes up is always, what is R? And really, when you're looking at a problem like this, the resistance, um, which might be a, an equivalent resistance, is the equivalent resistance of the current that's flowing through this RC circuit. Since there's no current going through the 550 ohm resistor, there like the RC circuit really only includes the 800 ohm resistor. Even, and that's fairly easy to understand because the switch is open up to the right. So there is no current going through that 550 ohm resistor. And in part E, we're gonna have to explain how this would change. The clearest answer is that when you're looking at an RC circuit, you model the circuit as if there's just one capacitor and just one resistor. So you would have to calculate it, you might have to calculate an equivalent resistance and maybe even an equivalent capacitance. In this case, it's quite clear, there's just one capacitor and one resistor. So here, R is 800 ohms. And C is, ah, C is not known. We're given area and stuff. So that's, Simple though, we have an equation, epsilon naught times the area divided by the distance between the plates. So we can find out that because epsilon naught is a constant, 8.85 oops, times 10 to the negative 12 times the area, which was 0 0.5 meters squared, divided by the distance, which is also luckily in meters, it's 10 to the negative 8 meters. And we find that the capacitance C is 4.425 times 10 to the negative 4 farads. So then the question becomes, what is I naught? Uh, because we know the time, we know the exponent function, we know C and we know R, which means we know tau. So the only question then is, what is I naught? So, I naught is the initial current. Now, going back to sort of first principles, when a capacitor is uncharged, and it tells us in the problem statement that is an, it is initially uncharged at time t equals zero, it behaves like a wire in the sense that there is no delta V, there's no potential difference between the um, capacitor plates. Excuse me, I'm blanking there for a second. So because it behaves like a wire, then the current that would be going through at that instant, and though this is only valid for the instant when the capacitor is uncharged and for the instant when it behaves like a wire, that means that it's equal to the current going through the capacitor. And you can sort of imagine for that instant replacing it with a wire, and then you just have 25 volts driving an 800 ohm resistor. Now, the other way to look at this is that you just substitute in the EMF divided by the resistance, which is the same thing. I mean, and that just comes from the equation, basically, when you have a capacitor that's charging. But I was hoping to um, tie this into first principles of the idea of the uncharged capacitor behaving like, an, like a, a wire. So then we substitute in. We have our EMF as 25 volts divided by 800 ohm resistor for I naught. So now this becomes the current at T is equal to 0 0.5 seconds is equal to 25 over 800 times E to the power of negative 0 0.5 because that's the time divided by RC and we have 800 times 4.425 times 10 to the negative 4. And we can solve that, and we get the current at t equals 0 0.5 seconds as 
7.6 milliamps. I'm getting 7.6 times 10 to the negative 3 amps. All right, so let's look at part B. So at part B, we have at t equals 0 0.5 seconds, find the power output of the battery. And we just found at A, the current was 7.6 milliamps. So at B, we have to find the power output. And remember, power is equal to the voltage times the current. So we can, and since we know the current and we know the voltage, we can just substitute in our 25 volts times 7.6 times 10 to the negative 3 amps. We find the power is 0 0.19 watts. At this point, I would say, are there any questions? But <laughs> there's nobody live, so maybe I should just double check that. Uh, what can I do? A new page here. Oops, that's not what I wanted. There. No. All right. I should actually hear it if somebody chimes in, but hey, it doesn't hurt to check. All right. So then part C. And the tool I'm using to do this doesn't maintain the screens very well. We had 7.6 milliamps, and then we had 0 0.19 watts for B. So now we're looking at how much energy is stored in the capacitor. And for a capacitor, the potential energy stored on the capacitor is equal to Q squared, that's the charge on one plate squared, divided by two times the capacitance. And at this point, we know the capacitance, we know two, we don't know the charge, and we don't know the potential energy stored on the capacitor. That's what we're trying to find. So we can actually solve for Q fairly easily, though, where the charge on a capacitor plate at t equals 0 0.5 seconds is equal to C times epsilon, and then here we have 1 minus the exponential decay, because as the capacitor is charging, I'm just going to draw this over here. So if we have time on the bottom axis, uh, axis and we have charge, then essentially we have this curve where it asymptotically approaches the maximum charge. So Q max starts out at zero. Whereas the exponential decay function looks like sort of the opposite of that. This is, I want to switch that to blue. So on the top, we have 1 minus E. And on the bottom, this represents E. And anyway, the reason I draw that is, is because I find it easy to remember that exponential decay looks like this. So 1 minus that gives this charging curve. And I know that the charge starts at 0, and it ends up sort of reaching this approximate point. So that's why I do it that way myself. Anyway, so we have 1 minus e to the power of negative t over rc. And at this point, I think we know everything here. We know c, we know r, we know t. We know e and 1, we know the epsilon, the emf, and we know c. So yeah, we can just substitute in for this. This actually isn't so bad. So we have 4425 times 10 to the negative 4 farads for the capacitor. The EMS, EMF is 25 volts. And we have 1 minus e to the negative 0 0.5 divided by 800 times 4.425 times 10 to the negative 4 farads. And then I got the charge. 8.4, I'm getting 8.368 times 10 to the negative 3, and that's in coulombs. Then it's just a matter of plugging that in. So we have, uh, I'm going to carve out some space. I'll just switch colors here. Very handy to switch colors uh, when you're taking notes because you can cram things into a tight space and it's not necessarily brutal to read. 
So if I have u is equal to q squared over 2c, now I know q, I know c, and I know the 2, so I can substitute in. We have our 8.368 times 10 to the negative 3 squared. And I'm keeping more sig figs there than is realistic. And I recommend that you do that for intermediate calculations and then round off at the end. Then the capacitance, again, no. 4.425 times 10 to the negative 4. And we find that the potential energy stored on the capacitor at this time is equal to 0 0.0791 joules. And that's just my external drive reconnecting itself. So I think I can close that. So I would round that off, uh, I guess, at 0 0.08 joules. And I keep switching from cursive to printed J's. Sorry about that. All right, we're getting there. So once again, now we're looking at part D. What is the rate of energy storage? Again, at T equals 0 0.5 seconds. I solved this a certain way when I set up this test question. And then while I was grading it, realized there was a much easier way because most of the students were actually doing it the easier way. So you know what? I'll just show you the easier way. So the rate of energy storage at that time is the basically the power going into the capacitor. And the power of an element at any point of time is equal to the voltage across that element times the current going through that element. And it turns out that it's actually pretty easy to get. I mean, we just found the current going through that element in part A, and we had 7.6 milliamps. So that part is known. And the voltage across the capacitor is actually pretty easy to get because the voltage across the capacitor is equal to the charge on the capacitors divided by the capacitance. And we just found the charge in, uh, actually, we well, we did find it as part of solving for part C. And the charge was... I'm confusing myself with how I've laid out my solution because I've mixed the things here and there. So, and that's because I did it the hard way first. The charge was 8.368 times 10 to the negative 3 coulombs. And we're dividing by farads. We have 4.425 times 10 to the negative 4 farads. And that gives us a voltage of 18.9 volts. So then the power across the capacitor, the power going into the capacitor, because we know that the capacitor is being charged, is equal to that voltage of 18.9 volts times, I guess it, I should use 7.61 times 10 to the negative 3 amps. Use all my sig figs. And I end up getting 1.44 joules uh, per second, which is watts. All right, so now we're ready for the last one. I'm just, con just going to summarize the answers that we had. We had 7.6 milliamps for B. The power output of the battery was 0 0.19 watts. For part C, the energy stored in the capacitor was 0 0.08 joules. And for part D, we had 1.4 watts. That's how quickly energy is being stored in the capacitor. Now for part E, switch S is closed. And I have to briefly explain how my answer to part A would change. And that's the current through the 800 ohm resistor. And the interesting thing here is actually what I'm going to do is just highlight 
the different things. So I'm going to identify which elements are sort of in series and parallel. So we have a blue wire. We have a red wire. So what this tells me is that we have 25 volts across the capacitor and the 800 ohm resistor. And we have 25 volts across the 550 ohm resistor. Now, if I actually go back to part A, so D, C, B, A, the whole thing here was that we had 25 volts across the capacitor in the 800 ohm resistor. And remember when we set this up, using the EMF over the resistor, we used 25 volts, and that's appropriate. If we go back now to part E, if I was going to set this up again, I would actually get exactly the same thing. We still have a voltage source in, of, in the EMF that is supplying 25 volts. What happens is that then it doesn't change the RC circuit at all. So the RC circuit, the RC circuit, uh, which has the, I guess it's four, was it microfarads or 0.44? It's 0 0.44 microfarads, millifarads. So it's actually 442 microfarads. 443 microfarads, micro like that. So 443 microfarad capacitor and 800 ohm resistor. It actually doesn't change. So, the but uh, you know there's a difference, <laughs> excuse me. You know there is some difference and actually the difference is only on the right of the switch. What happens then is that the amount of current being provided by the voltage source, so the EMF, it fixes the voltage. We have a constant 25 volts, but it might need to supply more current in order to maintain that 25 volts. So it does, it supplies more current. It has the same amount of current as before going through the 800 ohm resistor, going through the capacitor, but there is additional current. So we have this current, I guess I would call it I1, would be the same as it was before. But in addition, I2 is now non-zero. And we have 25 volts going across that 550 ohm uh, resistor, so we could solve for that current. We're not being asked to. What does change is that the EMF, which is at 25 volts, supplies more current. Because it drives the RC circuit. And the 550 ohm resistor. But the key thing is that the RC circuit itself doesn't change. Therefore, the current through the capacitor, I could call that IC, I guess I'll call that IC. Up, up here I labeled it I1, but I can call that IC, is the same as it was before, 7.6 milliamps. And that's it for this question. All right, so um, it's approaching 10.30. I'll... Actually, I'm only going to stick around for another minute or so. 
um, since nobody is online right now. But if you have questions that you would like me to address in the future, then please send me an email to scott at redmondphysicstutoring.com. Or if you're coming here from my Udemy course, you can send a message within Udemy so that you don't have to actually send me your email address because that's a no-no. I'm not allowed to ask for it, so I, I won't. Um, you can send me a message within Udemy. You can comment on one of my YouTube videos, or you can send me an email, whichever you prefer. I hope this is, was helpful to you, and I look forward to hearing that you're doing better in physics. So good luck, and I'll hopefully talk to you with another one of these next week.